Hell yeah, what's up guys? It's Chris Pike. My friends call me Big C. Back in action today, I'm back using Heartbeat, and I want to talk to you about trebuchets, the siege weapon of choice since 400 BC, <laughs> or before Common Era, depending on how you want to do that. Guys, this has been around for a while, as you all know, but here's the thing. I found a really cool video on the internet, and I want to show you how I use Heartbeat to find what I think are some of the best moments and some of the best videos out there. And I happen to like Warfare, so let's just dig right in and check out some of my favorite moments from Trebuchets. Let's click on the first one here. It starts at 00. zero. And before I go any further here, you're going to notice here that these uh, these moments are actually not in numerical order, or I guess in temporal order is the correct way to put it, even though numerical sort of works too. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on these two arrows here, and then I'm going to sort them by start time. So if you ever see, uh, if you ever see that your uh, moments seem to be a little bit jumbled in terms of time, just go ahead and do what I just did there. All right, let's start it off here, and let's take a look at one of the best scenes of, of using a trebuchet in a movie. Whack! There you go, the trebuchet guy. So we're gonna learn about, you know, when it, you know, how long it's been in use for, the different types of siege weaponry, uh, from mangonels, onagers, trebuchets, all of these cool things, catapults. You're gonna see leverage versus torsion. There's so much cool stuff here in this video. So let's kick it off here. I'm gonna skip forward to 13 seconds, and here we're gonna get a quick intro to the siege weapon of choice. The trebuchet. This was a powerful type of catapult and yeah. siege weapon used in several variations from the fourth century BC until around the 15th century when gunpowder weapons became more common yeah, great balls of fire. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, the uh, the yeah gunpowder became a big deal in the 15th century, especially uh, with the fall of Constantinople in 1453. See, I read some books when I was younger, but uh, yeah, let's keep going here. Uh, we're gonna go now to the beautiful and terrifying, even though I didn't put that right. So I got an add a Y. So you'll see here, I just clicked on that pen, and I gotta add in terrifying. So there we go. I gotta learn how to spell, Curtis. All right, let's get forward to 43 seconds. You're gonna love this. Their construction and use was a spectacle yeah. in many ways, both beautiful and terrifying. Mm. Their mere presence alone could be enough to end a siege. Given how iconic the oh. trebuchet is, Chicken. it's no wonder it has appeared in many different shapes and forms in Hollywood and in video games. Yes. So, oh, look at that. Age of Empires. Uh, yeah, we're going to, that's the number one use of trebs right there. He's going to treb your castle, or this is actually a town hall. But uh, yeah, jokes aside, guys, yeah, even showing up when one, if two armies were to, if an army was to approach one army without siege weaponry and one with, it's very likely that you're going to get them to surrender even without firing a shot. In fact, there's a really good example coming up here of that. So let's skip forward here to a minute nine where they talk about the difference between trebu trebuchets and catapults and leverage versus torsion. Unlike more ancient catapults that used tension or torsion energy yeah. to launch a projectile, trebuchets Oops. use the principles of leverage. Trebuchets quickly outmatch tension catapults in their ability to throw heavier projectiles at much greater ranges. Yeah. And for large trebuchets, even outside the range of archers. Yeah, and it looked like they were launching elephants in that last bit. Love it. Let's skip forward a bit here. Okay. The earliest form of trebuchet, often excluded from the movies and history lessons, is the mangonel, yes. which instead of using counterweights, used traction to launch projectiles. The mangonel hmm. operated using manpower. Men would pull cords to swing the main lever. Yeah, so you gotta be very, very, you gotta have big you-know-whats to be dangling around with those things, launching that kind of stuff. But there you go, this is very cool because you get a very neat history lesson and the, you know, the evolution of the trebuchet from catapult to mangonel to onager, you'll see. Let's keep going. It should be noted that the term mangonel has been used as a general term for medieval mm -hmm. stone throwing artillery. So sometimes Roman catapults or onager yes. are less accurately referred to as mangonel. 
Yes, so the terminology is important here, and that's a very cool point that he brings up, the different terms that were used. And sometimes, you know, what I think is a trebuchet, someone else might call an onager, and another person might call a mangonel, etc., etc. So very cool. It's definitely worth listening to that. Let's get forward, though, to 307, where he talks about counterweight and the different styles and the different ways of launching uh, trebs and, and what goes into, you know, dis determining you know, how far you can shoot and how to aim them and all that good stuff. Counterweight trebuchets did yeah. not replace traction trebuchets. Counterweight trebuchets did require fewer men to operate, That's good. had greater range, and could fire larger projectiles. However, they took significant time to construct, which typically had to be done on the battlefield. Medieval engineers yeah. would transplant components to build a trebuchet, pulleys, metal reinforcements, rope, and sometimes lead counterweights. So that's a very interesting point. They, these um, ones had to be built on the battlefield as opposed to being brought by, you know, oxen or horse or whatever to the field. You, they would break them apart or they would c construct them and then break them in their constituent pieces, transport them, and then build them on the battlefield. This was the same, though, for catapults, especially uh, for the siege of Constantinople, uh, one of the biggest uses of... Uh, early cannons, they were casting foundries and building them right on the spot, right in front of the walls. So very interesting stuff. I'm going to go forward a little bit here, and you're going to talk about potential energy and then counterweight versus, you know, lead, sand, stone, all the different things they could use as counterweights and how to uh, aim them. So let's go into that part next. Counterweight trebuchets rely on potential energy cool. from a slowly raised counterweight which could be lead or a box filled with sand or stone. This is hoisted into the air while the long section of the lever or beam remains close to the ground, cool. tethered to the projectile. Once the trebuchet weight is released, the beam rotates yeah. vertically through a wide arc. Because the projectile section of the beam is longer and further attached to a long sling that holds the projectile, the mechanical advantage is greatly increased. Ratios of the projectile side of the beam could be three to six times the length than on the ballast side of the axle. The mechanics of such a throw can be recreated using a stick with a sling. This is very interesting. So he goes, yeah, obviously he goes into great depth on how this works, but watch what's coming next. You'll see a use of a, I guess, primitive mangonel in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is very strange. Creating a hand trebuchet. Look at this. Also weird. The largest of trebuchets could obtain ranges greater than 350 Yo, meters. Yo, watch the rock. Flinging a 100 kilogram or more stone. Yeah, 350 milliliter or millimeter or meters. Pardon me, not millimeters. What the heck am I walk, talking about? 100 kilogram stone. That is like a giant. That is one big giant rock coming your way. If you know what I'm talking about. So, something very interesting to keep in mind. Let's skip forward. Actually, I'm going to go to five. Let's keep for skip forward here to the Outlaw King. This is where they show the War Wolf, which was the biggest trebuchet built ever in 1304 for the Battle of Sterling. Yes, here we go. In the movie The Outlaw King, a representation of the largest trebuchet ever built is shown, known as War Wolf. War Wolf. This was used during the Siege of Sterling in 1304. The design shows man-powered tread wheels, a common method used for hoisting or lifting great weight during this period. Very cool. Warwolf was said to have been built over three months by 50 men. Yeah, 50 people, three months, that's going to fling one hell of a rock. Let's take a look at it. Sources say the Scots surrendered to Edward I of England before the weapon was finished and that Edward decided to use it anyway. Yeah, that sounds about right. Them English kings, let me tell you. Yeah, Edward, not nice. Releasing one shot against the castle in a display of triumph. Ooh. Design features of counterweight trebuchets vary. Wheels can help absorb some of the rocking force given off when a trebuchet cool, is fired. That. Trebuchets can easily rock or shake themselves to pieces. Wheels can further help transfer momentum to a projectile like nice. a pitcher stepping into a throw. However, a sturdy base was sometimes the better design. 
So there you go. There's a little bit about the different designs, some with wheels, some without wheels, depending on the situation. Very cool stuff. I can't recommend this video enough. I mean, I just love siege weaponry, so I guess I'm a little biased here. But let's get forward a few more seconds where uh, he talks about adjusting range, the size of projectiles and things like that. Adjustments to range were accomplished by adjusting the counterweight, the length of the sling used, and the size of the projectile. Hmm. Trebuchets with swinging baskets were easier to adjust as the counterweight could be adjusted by simply shoveling in or out sand. Trebuchets oh. with fixed timbers and no basket often used lead counterweights, and such lead was expensive and hard to come by. <laughs> Swinging <laughs> counterweights also provided a mechanical advantage, allowing the counterweight to descend for longer in a straight line, harnessing more energy for cool. the throw. Look at this. Ammunition for trebuchets could take several forms. Yes, this is very interesting. Uh, you're going to, yeah, the use of, like, dead horses and things like that. It's really weird. Chiseled stone was most common, but sewage, carcasses, and flammable projectiles were used. Common stone projectiles were carefully made to be the same size and weight. So the use of carcasses, for example, would be a way to spread disease and stuff like that inside the walls, especially during a siege, because, yeah, you can't really get out. So very, very dark stuff, guys. War was nasty business. But there you go. This is just some of the moments that I really enjoyed in this uh, video. I am in no way a military expert, but I really enjoyed learning from this. So, guys, this is just one way you can go ahead and make some moments, find some videos on YouTube, your own videos or someone else's videos. Hit that H key. Submit the, you know, create your moments and get paid for them, guys. You don't have to go through the 4K, 1K or any of that nonsense. Make good stuff. Get paid. We're doing it. Thanks for watching.